Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue our coverage of the situation in North St. Louis, where 40,000 tons of illegally buried nuclear waste left over from the World War II Manhattan Project sits near the surface of a landfill in the path of a slow-burning underground fire. This week, we speak with Brian DeLear, who is a local resident, a green energy business professional, and a candidate for state representative. Brian fills us in on the insane legal dealings that allowed this situation to occur and where some of those same laws point out who's responsible for the cleanup. Then Mimi Gurman of Radcast fills us in on the radiation monitoring that's going on and provides information on how you, yes you, can become a citizen scientist and take those crucial radiation readings that the EPA can't quite manage to achieve. We're going to be adding a tip a week from Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, or RAPT, so that you can start understanding the best possible ways to safeguard your health in a radioactive environment. Plus, our regular Num Nuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than any of us is getting from the EPA. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. At the Westlake Landfill in North St. Louis, where more than 40,000 tons of radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project are buried and in the path of an underground fire, on October 24th, a brush fire on the surface came to within 75 yards of the radioactive waste. Then, only three days later, between 10 and 11,000 gallons of highly toxic leachate leaked after a break in a force main. And we're supposed to trust that Republic Corporation, the owner-operators of the site, are able to handle the nuclear waste in a responsible way? On Sunday, October 19, at a Nevada state-owned radioactive waste dump, 120 miles away from Las Vegas, explosions preceded a fire that took place, and we've got the video to prove it up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode, number 228. Debris from the blast spread 190 feet, and two heavily corroded 55-gallon drums were found outside of the fence line of the property. Energy Corporation has announced plans to shut down its Fitzpatrick nuclear power plant in upstate New York, but only after the reactor runs out of fuel in late 2016 or early 2017. Shoot it now, put it out of its misery. Entergy has also announced that it will be shutting down its Pilgrim nuclear plant in Massachusetts, but only sometime between now and the end of 2019. Not good enough, Cape Cod activists, students, environmentalists, and state legislators gathered in the State House on Thursday, October 22nd, to call for the immediate shutdown of Pilgrim. In Virginia, the Attorney General's office has called for Dominion Virginia Power to abandon plans to build a third nuclear power reactor, calling it a waste of billions of dollars on an excessively expensive power source. Note that North Anna's two reactors were only 11 miles from the epicenter of the 2011 5.8 earthquake that rocked the East Coast. Environmental Protection Agency officials have admitted that 99 out of 135 sensors they use to measure beta radiation in their RADnet system are not able to check for levels in real time and so have been turned off. This according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. And as if that's not bad enough... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, num nuts of the week. A Kansas laboratory responsible for testing for contamination in the event of an accident at the state's only nuclear power plant hasn't exactly been doing its job since September 22nd because that's the last time there was staff. 
That's right. Nobody's home. In addition to routine testing at the Wolf Creek Nuclear Power Plant south of Topeka, the lab would be called upon to analyze samples which would determine the extent of resulting contamination in the event of an accident. So you see, they never want to have the data on what's actually going on. And that's why the whole nuclear industry is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. And the New York Times reports that closed nuclear reactors are dipping into funds set aside for their eventual dismantling in order to build waste storage on site, which raises a lot of questions about whether there will be enough money to dismantle them when the time comes. Over to Japan, where for only the second time since the nuclear disaster at Fukushima began in 2011, a nuclear power plant has begun operating at full power despite massive demonstrations by the Japanese public. Another reactor, Ikata-3, took a step closer to being the third reactor to restart in Japan. Situated on the Ring of Fire, Earthquake, Tsunami, Typhoon Zone, what could go wrong? We already know the answer to that one. At Fukushima, on October 30th, TEP Tokyo Electric Power Company announced that strontium-90 density had reached the highest level ever observed next to Reactor 2, 7,100,000 becquerels per square meter, which is high enough to kill you in less than an hour, and it is still not under control. TEPCO also announced that their new Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, leaked highly contaminated water, which it is designed to contain. The leakage occurred when the system was restarted after maintenance, and they don't know what caused it. Internationally, a loud explosion preceded a fire at the Belgian Duel nuclear reactors near Antwerp. In Canada, homes and businesses within 10 kilometers, about 6.5 miles, of the Pickering nuclear power plant have been supplied with potassium iodide pills just in case there's a radiological accident. Sweden has confirmed that it will be decommissioning two more nuclear reactors, one in 2019 and one in 2020, each after 44 years of operation. And a new report on the aftermath of Chernobyl shows that 85% of children from Belarus have sustained permanent genetic damage. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first... The Nuclear Hot Seat website is back up and about to be even better than ever because we just resolved a major tech glitch, and now I'll be able to reload the information as planned. Yes! Many of you had part in helping us make this happen, and I thank you for your support because you gave it when it was needed. Thing is, support is still needed. Nuclear Hot Seat has monthly operating expenses, and we've got our eyes on some plugins to make navigation even easier. So your donation is not only welcomed, it's necessary. To donate, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer to not donate online, Email me at info at nuclearhotseat.com and you, yes, you will get a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you can do to keep the help coming to Nuclear Hot Seat, thank you as we continue to grow. Brian DeLear lives near the Westlake Landfill and has been involved in clean energy issues as chairman and CEO of Energy Equity Funding. He is a columnist with Examiner.com was founder of Global Peace Solution, and is currently running for state representative. We spoke about the politics behind the Westlake nuclear hot potato. Byron DeLear, thank you so much for joining us on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I heard the other program that you produced with Bob Alvarez, Don Chapman, and Dr. Helen Caldicott, and I think you do wonderful work. Thank you so much. What is your background I have had a background in environmental work for 10 or 12 years. I actually worked on the Santa Susana Field Lab in Southern California. I was with the Physicians for Social Responsibility Nuclear Nonproliferation Committee and uh, took a tour of the site with the Physicians for Social Responsibility. And I was just shocked to uh, learn that these 
ex-military sites were very present in populated areas and posed ongoing health threats to a a lot of different uh, residents. And indeed, we have a situation here in St. Louis, which is very reminiscent, which is the Westlake Landfill. I have great empathy, not only because of Three Mile Island, but when you say Santa Susana Field Lab, that's my neighborhood. That's less than 30 miles away from where I'm living now. How close do you live to the Westlake site, and how did you first become aware of the problems there? I live about four or five miles south of the site in the city of Maryland Heights, and I became aware of the situation through my friend Harvey Ferdman. I'd worked with uh, Harvey Ferdman on uh, political campaigns over the years. I ran for Congress here in the area in 2008. I ran to oppose a gentleman named uh, Representative Todd Aiken. But uh, Harvey has been working on this issue. He actually coordinated with Don Chapman, who's part of Just Moms STL, and Representative Bill Otto. Harvey represents Bill's office in the uh, context of the Westlake landfill issue. You've written about the history and the dangers on the site. And one of the phrases that struck me is you were writing about the impasse at Westlake, and you also referred to it as a nuclear hot potato. Explain what you mean by those phrases. When I use the phrase nuclear hot potato or the impasse at Westlake, it's just really shocking that you have a site in a densely populated area in a county of nearly a million people where uh, Manhattan Project nuclear waste is just sitting out there on the surface of this site and threatening the uh, local population. This material is not safe. It has uh, uranium and thorium and the daughter products or or, uh, radon progeny, and it becomes uh, an ongoing health threat. I feel that the nuclear hot potato refers to the fact that in 1962, we have the Atomic Energy Commission putting up for auction the materials of the oldest nuclear waste dump, which is the St. Louis Airport site, which is a 22-acre site near the St. Louis Airport where Mallinckrodt Chemical Works put a lot of the byproduct materials associated with processing uranium. And Mallinckrodt Chemical Works was a company that initially agreed to process uranium for not only the, the first reactive pile up in Chicago, the Fermi pile as it's referred to, but it also produced all the uranium for the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs and the early Cold War years in regard to the nuclear weapons development. In fact, Mallinckrodt Chemical Works processed all the uranium for the United States of America until the late 1950s. And it put probably in excess of 125,000 tons of this material up at the airport site. It's stored it up there. This was nuclear waste products with exotic names such as Belgian Congo raffinate, Colorado raffinate, radium-bearing residues, leached barium sulfate. And there were a number of processes that Mallinckrodt was engaging in to refine the uranium ore that it received to higher levels of purity. This was the material that was left over after those source materials were extracted. And this material was uh, put in rusty barrels. It was put out in piles in the open. It leached into Coldwater Creek. And eventually, we have over 100 contaminated sites in the uh, St. Louis region. All those sites have fallen under the appropriate federal cleanup program, except for the Westlake landfill. Why in the world is this extremely contaminated site not covered by the federal cleanup, which I believe is referred to as FUSRAP or Formerly Utilized Sites Remedial Action Program. We have over 100 contaminated sites in the St. Louis area. And like you mentioned, they've all fallen under the appropriate federal cleanup program, which is called FUSRAP for nuclear weapons related waste, except for the Westlake landfill. The question is why? And the answer is, it all comes down to this very obscure transaction in the 1960s when the Atomic Energy Commission auctioned off all the contents of the airport nuclear waste site. And it had, like, odd instructions to the bidders 
like, quote, everything must go, unquote. So it just seems that the Atomic Energy Commission was interested in retiring the site rather than just perhaps auctioning off materials that may have some sort of economic value to private entities that are interested in uh, participating in the nuclear industry. And so the nuclear hot potato factor comes into play because the first company that made the bid was called Contemporary Metals Corporation. And the records are sometimes contradictory and confusing, the primary source records. But Contemporary Metals Corporation either changed their name to Continental Milling and Mining of Chicago or Continental Milling and Mining was a subsidiary of Contemporary Metals. But uh, the license was uh, then transferred to Continental Mining and Milling, and then that firm went belly up. Their uh, lender was called Commercial Discount Corporation. They acquired the materials and then acquired the license for the materials from the Atomic Energy Commission. And then they eventually sold it to Cotter Corporation, which uh, shipped much of the material to its processing facility in Colorado. But more than 40,000 tons were illegally dumped at Westlake. This was material that Cotter didn't really want to deal with, and they had written a site called Weldon Spring a couple times to see if they could dump it there. They were denied, so in their creativity, we shall say, they decided to mix it. Uh, I'm referring to 8,700 tons of leached barium sulfate. They decided to mix it with 39,000 tons of topsoil from the Laddie Avenue site, which was one of these contaminated sites. And then under the false rubric that this was considered clean fill dirt, they dumped it at the Westlake landfill. Now, I want to clarify something. I have heard that it was 40,000 pounds. You're now saying it's 40,000 tons? It's 40,000 tons. And it's actually anywhere between 43,000 tons and 48,000 tons. And to give your audience a sense of how much this material is, the towering gateway arch made of steel and concrete, 630 feet tall, only weighs 43,000 tons. So this is an amount equal to the weight of the Gateway Arch is sitting in the densely populated area of North St. Louis County. And it's just sitting out in the open in an uncontained fashion. It's not even the 55-gallon drums that they had when they were at the airport. It's not. And so some of the information that's out there tends to try to characterize the 8,700 tons of leached barium sulfate as not being that big of a threat. Now, this 8,700 tons of leached barium sulfate contains seven tons of uranium ore. And this would be ore that would be similar to uranium tailings uh, for uh, milling operations. But the problem is that the 39,000 tons of supposed topsoil that was mixed in to dilute the uranium content into an unlicensable level, supposedly, this topsoil was not merely topsoil. This topsoil was infused with uranium-238, uranium-235, thorium-232, radium-226, radium-228. This was the topsoil that was taken from Laddie Avenue, which was one of the sites where they laid out all these exotic materials, Colorado raffinate, Belgian Congo raffinate, to dry. And after the dumping at Westlake, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission tested the Laddie Avenue site and found very clearly that the Laddie Avenue site had thorium and radium contamination in excess of the federal guidelines up to the uh, depths of 18 inches in the soil. And this is after it had been scraped up and mixed with the other material and dumped at Westlake. Correct. So many of these records are sketchy and uh, incomplete. In fact, the ombudsman for NIOSH, uh, Denise Brock, who has uh, done amazing work in securing compensatory funding for atomic energy workers in the amount of billions of dollars. Denise Brock states in no uncertain terms that Mallinckrodt's records are incomplete, They've been destroyed and in some cases purposefully altered. So in some sense, we really don't know what's dumped at Westlake. We really don't know what's there. 
And the site has never been fully characterized. And so this is one of the things that we're calling for as the most basic responsible handling of the situation is to actually do a grid-like full characterization of the site to see what's really there. It's a question for me as to whether there's even time to do that with the fire encroaching on the site. But with your connections in politics, how is this playing out? Is there any kind of response that's happening from local politicians, from, say, the representatives, from the city council in St. Louis? What has been the political outcry or lack thereof in connection with what's going on? This refers to the impasse at Westlake, and it's shocking because we really have bipartisan support to reevaluate this site and put it under the Army Corps of Engineers to get it cleaned up. Senator McCaskill, Senator Blunt have both signed a letter. The uh, St. Louis County Council has issued uh, statements in regard to this site and the necessity to move it over to Fusrap. But the reason why this site has been orphaned, if you will, is because of this obscure transaction. And the federal government today asserts, essentially, that it's not responsible for the cleanup because it sold the material to Cotter Corporation. But what's amazing is in the last few days, I have been studying some primary sources and in particular, the enabling legislation with regard to the Atomic Energy Commission, which is the Atomic Energy Act of 1946. And what that act says in no uncertain terms is it says that the commission has the right to distribute materials with or without charge distribute these byproduct materials, which are the wastes from the uh, uranium processing that Mallinckrodt conducted. But, and here's the key clause, the Atomic Energy Commission shall recall any distributed materials from any applicant who is not equipped to observe or who fails to observe such safety standards to protect health as may be established by the commission or who uses such materials in violation of the law or regulation of the commission or in a manner other than is disclosed in the application, therefore. This exactly describes the material that was dumped at Westlake, and it means that the federal government has a responsibility to clean it up. And this exact clause is repeated in the amended version of the law, which is the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. And in fact, in that law, it describes what byproduct material is. And it describes byproduct material as the tailings or wastes produced by the extraction or concentration of uranium or thorium from any ore processed primarily for its source material content. Again, this exactly describes the material that was stored at the airport site. It exactly describes the material that was sold to uh, Cotter Corporation, and it exactly describes the material that was dumped at Westlake. So the legislative intent here is absolutely clear. It basically says that the Atomic Energy Commission has the wherewithal to be able to distribute some of these byproduct materials for research or for other such uses. But if this material ever is mishandled or treated in a way that threatens the health of a community, or if this material is used in a way that it's not licensed for, the federal government shall recall that material, which means they are responsible to uh, pick this material up. And right now, the Department of Energy is essentially the inheritor of the Atomic Energy Commission's role and responsibility. So by my lights, it appears that the Department of Energy has a primary responsibility to retrieve this material as expressed by the people of the United States through their representatives through the federal law passed in 1946 and 1954. So clearly, by law, this is on the head of the feds to clean up. What if any progress has been made in bringing this to the attention of President Obama or the necessary representatives who are in Washington, D.C., so that action can be taken. So I've spoken to some contacts in Washington, D.C. that are nuclear policy experts, and they think that this uh, legislative intent holds water. Although the legal theory may need to be played out in a court of law, 
certainly what it communicates unequivocally is that the federal government has a responsibility to retrieve any material that's threatening any population. It's just interesting because nobody has really brought this to light before, and I think that it's important to do so because it shows that the enabling legislation for the Atomic Energy Commission is very clear in its intent. I think that perhaps in the changing of the guard from the Atomic Energy Commission to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the federal government dropped the ball and failed to follow the law. What strikes me about this is it sounds like the feds are fiddling while Rome or St. Louis burns because if they say they need to study it, they need to come up with whatever they need. We're talking about a landfill fire that is estimated to intersect with this radioactive waste in, at this point, two and a half to five and a half months. So has there been any effort made, either by your Governor Jay Nixon declaring a state of emergency or getting President Obama's attention or any of the so many nominees or intended nominees or hopeful nominees for on either the Republican or the Democratic side to step forward and take over and take some responsibility in this? You know, I get a feeling that many of the political actors, including, you know, Governor Nixon and even the White House, are sort of orbiting around this issue and trying to bide their time to determine what it is that they should do. Because at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is a half a billion dollar or perhaps even a billion dollar cleanup for this site. And it's just leading to a state of administerial paralysis. There have been efforts to fearmonger this issue, to say that we should leave this material alone, that it will threaten the community. But this is all just a bunch of hogwash. Because from 1992 to 2004, the Army Corps of Engineers FUSRAP program removed an astounding 288,000 tons of radiologically contaminated material from North St. Louis County. The material was shipped by specially constructed rail cars, and it was uh, sent to licensed out-of-state disposal facilities without a single incident. So there are many in this community that feel that the federal government created this material for the Manhattan Project and that the people that are living near this site are suffering due to the defense of our nation, and therefore it has an appropriate place on the desk of the Commander-in-Chief. The EPA, the Department of Energy, the Army Corps of Engineers are all under the White House. I wrote an op-ed at the end of uh, August calling for President Obama to take executive action on this issue. And I think that President Obama needs to take executive action on this issue. In regard to the governor of our state, Jay Nixon, the community activist group Just Moms SDL delivered 12,000 signatures calling on the governor to declare a state of emergency. And I believe we have yet to hear any substantive communication from the governor's office that they're pursuing this. I think that the escalation of this issue and Sadly, the encroaching fire from the Bridgeton landfill has propelled this story into the national consciousness. I believe that we're going to get action on this issue, and we just need to keep hammering the fact that it is untenable to leave nearly 50,000 tons of radiologically contaminated material in the center of a county of a million people. What? can be done and what can we do to support you and the others who live in that area in moving this forward with all speed? Social media is incredibly powerful today. And Levy, shows like Nuclear Hot Seat get the message out there in a decentralized way to people that would have never heard it through the mainstream media. Fortunately, networks like CBS are covering this issue and this issue is penetrating the national media. But I would just suggest to your audience to join the Facebook page, Westlake Community Group. That is sort of the central hub where many of the articles and progress on this issue are being shared with the community. And to just replicate and promote this information out there to help bring safety to this community. I mean, the folks that live near this site, closer than I live to it, uh, have been suffering and it's time for their suffering to end. There's a very reasonable plan to where the property values should be protected because the property values are plummeting. 
The site should be moved over to Foos Wrap so that material can be removed. And uh, there should be a one-mile buyout of the houses in the region. I believe it's about 90 residences. This would be a pittance compared to the amount of money that's been spent already to sort of uh, obfuscate the issue in some cases or just kick the can down the road. We need to face the fact that this is Manhattan Project nuclear waste and the pertinent federal cleanup program needs to be brought to bear to bring safety to this community once and for all. Byron, of course, my heart and the heart of so many listeners goes out to you and all of the individuals who are stuck living with this nightmare in their own backyards. And I know from the response we've already gotten to that first show that we will continue to utilize social media and everything else to get the word out about this and that Nuclear Hot Seat is pledged to continue to cover this issue for as long as it lasts, which considering the half-life of thorium, it isn't going to go away anytime soon. And I would just say, Libby, that Dr. Helen Caldicott will be coming out to the St. Louis region and will be speaking at a symposium at the St. Louis Community College on Saturday, February 20th. And she will be joined by Denise Brock, the uh, ombudsman for NIOSH with the CDC, who's been doing amazing work to provide compensation for atomic energy workers, and specific the Mallinckrodt workers. Also, Councilman Sam Page, who is a doctor and very uh, much in tune with the medical issues that are of concern here with regard to uh, the influence of radioactivity in the community. So there's some great actions going on right now, and there will also be some new studies and reports that will be coming out soon that are going to shine new light on how this material has uh, leached off-site, and any sort of conception that it's safe to leave it there will be completely dispelled. Byron, you're doing great work, as so many others are, and you better watch out or you might find me there on February 20th as well. You would be more than welcome, Libby. Well, we'll see what we can do. Byron DeLear, thank you so much for taking the time to be my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Thank you. That was Brian DeLear, who, among other things, lives within seven miles of the Westlake Landfill. Before we get to our next interview, if you live in the Westlake area, near any nuclear facility or reactor, or are worried about the worldwide nuclear contamination from Fukushima, here's a tip on safeguarding your health from Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, or RAPT. Make certain that you take a high-quality multivitamin and mineral every day. Why? Here's a very simplified explanation. Your body needs essential minerals, and when you don't have enough of the good stuff, your body will source it from wherever possible. Now, some radionuclides mimic minerals. For example, strontium-90 mimics calcium. If your body is low on calcium, and you ingest strontium-90 from contaminated food or water, Your body will think it's calcium and absorb it into your bones and teeth, and that's where it stays. But if you have enough calcium circulating in your body, either through food or supplementation, it will ignore any strontium-90 that it might be in contact with, and if it's in your body, will just excrete it. It will say, thanks, I'm full. No, no, really, I couldn't take another atom. And that's what you want. If you would like more information on best practices to help safeguard from radiation, go to raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com. That's where Radiation Awareness Protection Talk has a free report available for you, as well as more information on radiation and health. So you know, RAPT is a six-audio series on best possible practices for safeguarding health against the ravages of nuclear radiation. It was put together by myself and certified nutrition educator Kimberly Roberson, who founded Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, which focuses on food issues, and is also the author of Silent Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response. RAPT is a compilation of vetted, 
footnoted verifiable information on everything from food and water and air purification to what to do in an emergency, what to do about your garden, how to take care of your pets. To support our friends in the St. Louis area, we have reduced the price of Wrapped at least through Sunday, November 15. So come to wrappedawareness.com and check us out. And this Sunday, November 8th, we will have a Wrapped live interview about using liquid zeolite to help safeguard from radiation. This interview is with a biochemist and will take on the recent controversial barrage by an online so-called health guru who has been attacking zeolite online while he's been launching his own product line. I so dislike bullies. So if you would want that information on zeolite, go to Wrapped on Facebook. We also have a site there. Just put in Wrapped. It will show up. And as of Wednesday, November 4, the sign-up will be there for the call on November 8th. Now it's time for our second interview. In terms of what can be done to take effective actions around Westlake, few people make it clearer or easier than Mimi Gurman. Mimi is the founder of Radcast, which focuses on helping citizen activists learn how to take accurate radiation readings and compiling their data to figure out what is going on, radiologically speaking, wherever the EPA has fallen down on the job, which is just about everywhere. Mimi, from your position as the founder of Radcast and someone who's been very involved in radiation readings and knowing how to interpret them, what are you seeing coming out of the Westlake landfill situation in North St. Louis? We only have a few readings at the moment. We've just begun the process of teaching people in the Westlake area what they need to be doing. And from the readings that we've received, and really it's only been about nine readings, I can't get a good picture from that few amount of readings. So what I'm seeing is on one side of a house, I'll see a reading that differs greatly from the other side of the house. Why? There's a different amount of radiation on one side of the house from the other side of the house. What I know is that this particular house, which is about seven miles out, has taken a couple of readings from the same area and we're getting the same results. So the next question is, why are we seeing more radiation on one side of the house and the other side of the house, north to south or east to west? Well, the next step is to take a soil sample from both yards, both sides of the house, to see if any dust settled, if any of the soil from whether it's, you know, the creek or west lake has settled on one side of this person's property. So we need a lot of information and a lot of data in order to let people know what's truly happening. And that is our goal. What does it take for someone to become involved in the testing process? I mean, is it as simple as you buy a radiation meter and you take readings? Is there a learning curve? How difficult is it? And what do they have to do in order to proceed? People can get in touch with me. I can put you in touch with one of the best Geiger counters that you can have, which is simple to use. I send you protocol on how to use it. I can tutor you in how to take tests, which are very easy to do, and you're on your way. All of the results from the tests that you take get emailed to me, and I record them on the Radcast report. You are free to do whatever you want with the same numbers, but I keep all of your results on the Radcast report for the general public to see at any given time. How many readings would you need throughout the area and to what distance in order to have enough of a sample to start seeing patterns and being able to read what's going on there? If we're seeing the same areas being tested by the same people, whatever their particular areas are, and I'm receiving, let's say, 50 reading samples from each of those people, I'll start to be able to put a picture together. But 10 readings is not going to tell me anything. Anything can happen after those 10 readings. So that's why it's imperative that people start to come together in the area of Westlake and decide Who can pool money to get a meter? Who can share these meters? You don't have to have individuals having meters. You can share these and get these readings done so that you can have the information that you need to understand if you are safe. 
this, of course, begs the question, where is the EPA in all of this? Because they're the ones who should be doing these readings and providing the data and informing us what the results actually mean. Where's the EPA? The EPA is as invisible on all of this as radiation is invisible to us. The EPA plays a game of whack-a-mole. They are in charge of monitors. They have large monitors that are incredibly efficient. The latest messaging from the EPA is our monitors, almost 80% of our monitors are broken. I don't believe them at all. I find that impossible. Why do you find that impossible? It's a governmental organization to have only 20% of what you have in place across the United States working, just it's a lie. It doesn't take rocket science to put a monitor together or to fix a part of a monitor that's broken. We have people out there, people at in colleges and universities, in nuclear engineering programs who can come out and fix these monitors. So to say that these monitors are broken is just another way to obfuscate the truth, which is they are overwhelmed, the EPA, with radiation sites, radioactive sites across the United States that everybody is waking up to due to the amounts of cancers that they cause. And the EPA is responsible for telling us what's going on and then dealing with the problem. And if they pretend that there is no problem because they've turned their monitors off, all of a sudden there is no problem. So this is what they've done. In St. Louis, their monitor has been off since June. They just turned their monitor on, I believe, due to the pressure of the people at Westlake about a week ago. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying monitor, meaning one? One. For all of St. Louis? One. There is one monitor there. It is a RADnet monitor. That's what the EPA has in place. Um, They have one monitor per area. There are maps out of the monitoring system that anybody can find. If you look up, I'm not sure of the exact site, but it's if you look up the EPA RADnet maps, you'll find it. And you'll see there's one monitor in Washington State near Hanford. By the way, that's shut down. There's a monitor towards Seattle. That one's on. There's a monitor near Portland. That's shut down. There are monitors in California, most of which are shut down. Again, they're saying that 80% of their monitoring system is broken. Then what are the workers doing at the EPA? What is their job? We have individuals whose job it is to deal with the information from these monitors. They still have jobs. So my question is, what are they doing? They go to work. It also strikes me as absurd because depending on the way the wind is blowing, if the monitor is not in the right place, they can completely duck out on any reading or get a false reading or a diminished reading. There have never been enough monitors put out by RADnet. And the fact that they turn them off and on at, it's basically whimsy. And I say that because they turn them off when a nuclear plant like the Columbia Generating Station in Washington State, when it's refueling and RADnet monitor situated at Hanford gets shut down, that's whimsy. That's also covering posterior because we know from other reports that when a nuclear reactor is being refueled, that's when the radiation spikes. And they cover that number. They should only have a number by averaging it out as the radiation exposure over the period of a year. So even if you're getting it in a very concentrated period of time when the refueling is taking place, it doesn't look that bad. It looks, quote unquote, low level because they've strung it out over 12 months. That's exactly right. And during the closure of the Columbia Generating Station, as an example that happened this past summer, I was watching the... EPA RADnet go on and off while CGS was refueling and moving fuel and watching these spikes happen. And as spikes would occur, they would shut down their monitor. 
And this shutdown, is this done on site by somebody climbing a ladder and flipping a switch? Is it done from a central office? Is it done by satellite? How is this affected? I believe having seen uh, some of the RADnet monitors that I'm not sure, I'm not positive. I think that there is a way to shut it off manually and they must have a way to just turn the computers off, which is what I think they do. I think they just turn the computer feed off. So the monitor might be going, but whatever it's reading is not being, nobody can see it. It's going into the abyss. So to bring this back to RADcast, which is your group, and what you are attempting to do in terms of put together some citizen monitoring, what you're saying about the EPA points out the absolute crucial need for people in Westlake and also near Coldwater Creek to step up, pool their money, and get monitors so that the readings can start taking place. That's exactly right. We have one Geiger counter in use there. I am about to send them one more. And if 10 people can get some monitors, that would be great. We would have a lot of information. People could really see what's going on. And at the same time, Radcast is taking soil samples from the people. And we have three soil samples that we've already put through the spectrometer and we're taking more and between the soil samples and the ambient readings which is what people do with the geiger counters we're we're trying to create a picture for the people if residents of the area wish to pursue this further with you and with radcast how do they proceed where do they go to get in contact with you they can write to me at info at radcast.org and I have protocol already written which I can send. I have a coupon that I give out for the Geiger counter that I recommend. The reason that I recommend this Geiger counter is that it's a really good, well-tested Geiger counter. We understand these Geiger counters. We have used these. We have tested many Many of us in the citizen science world of radiation reading, and there are many of us out there in all states in the U.S. and in different countries using these same meters, we know how good they are and how easy to use they are. And when you say you provide a coupon, what does that mean? It gives you a discount so that you have access to a Geiger counter, which would normally be close to $700 for $550. It also gives you access to the company that makes them. It offers you a guarantee with that if you buy directly from them as opposed to going online and buying through, you know, any sort of online site that sells Geiger counters because there are many. And it assures you that the Geiger counter is going to work the way it needs to work. You also get me. I will be your tutor. I will help you. You can call me once you get it to have me walk through how to do time tests, how to walk around, how not to use the Geiger counter. Any questions you have, I am here for you. We all need the information that you are living in. And you don't have it. We don't have it. The EPA, if they have it, won't give it. Though I don't know if they even have it, though. They probably do. I'm sure they do. So it's really imperative that we put the science together and that we take the moves and understand that this is not rocket science. This is about seeing the invisible, and there are ways for us to do that, and they are not scary when we have the tools to do it. What is scary is not knowing what is around you. That's very scary. People living around radioactive waste that blows in the air, that comes down in rain, that is on fire, that is smoking, that's terrifying. Having some semblance of your own safety to be able to say to yourself, this is what I want to do. This is going to be my next move. Am I leaving? Am I staying? Where am I going? What am I going to do with my kids? All of that is part of your toolbox of knowledge. You get to decide those things when you have the information. And I just want to help you get the information. And I want the information as well. The world wants the information as well. And you have to supply it. Mimi, we're going to stay in touch with you to learn more as you learn it about what the radiation levels are. For now, 
I want to thank you for once more being my guest on this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. That was Radcast founder Mimi Gurman. To learn more about how you can participate in collecting radiation readings from your area, and this is not just for St. Louis, this is for anywhere, go to radcast.org and contact Mimi directly at info at radcast.org. Activist shout out, a woo and a who, to Mary Olson, who is director of the Southeast Office of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS. Mary is an expert on the impact of radiation on women and reproduction and has presented her information at the United Nations, at Dr. Caldecott's Symposium of the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, and here on Nuclear Hot Seat in an interview we labeled Atomic Eggs. Well, on December 8th, Mary will participate in Gender Day in Paris as part of the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Isn't it nice that they should give half the population of the Earth its whole entire day, one out of 12? Be that as it may, Mary has been given five minutes to talk about radiation and its disproportionate impact in relation to gender. You would be amazed what this woman can do with five minutes. She would be in Paris, but alas, a broken ankle has kept her from even crowdfunding to make the trip, so she'll be participating through Skype. Meanwhile, we will be replaying her nuclear hot seat interview on Atomic Eggs for next week's show. It contains important information for women who have been exposed to radiation on their own health and what they must know if they are planning to have children. Here's today's final thought. In putting this show together today, I was struck by an article that I found that came from enenews.com. It was about the emergency response to the explosion and fire at the nuclear waste dump in Beatty, Nevada, less than 120 miles northwest of Las Vegas, but also approximately 18 miles from the Nevada test site. At a meeting of the Board of County Commissioners for Nye County, Vance Payne, the Director of Emergency Management, reported, Our federal partners from the Department of Energy put to bear resources I've never seen before. It was amazing. There were overflights of aircraft with special monitoring equipment that was put in the air just as fast as they were able. They did it on the ground. The civil support team came down from Reno, and they came down in a hurry. It was amazing how fast they moved their teams. They did ground testing, they did mid-level aerial testing, and they did high-level area testing over two towns, as well as the entire transportation line, north to south, on Highway 95 and 373. They'll continue to come in on the testing over the next few weeks, no radioactive materials were detected anywhere on the ground or the air. The first question that comes to mind upon reading that is, what the hell was in that dump to trigger that kind of a response? And more to the point, where's that level of response to North St. Louis? What have they got at Westlake and Coldwater Creek? One EPA monitor for all of St. Louis that may or may not be working at any given time, depending on Gina McCarthy's whim? This article proves that we as a country have the technology, people power, and muscle to respond in depth and with precision to the danger caused by a nuclear accident. What we lack as a nation, or at least our leadership does, is the will, the backbone. It's not money, it's priorities. And the middle class people of North St. Louis, along with most of the rest of us, are not very high on that priority list. Why such overkill, you should pardon the expression, in the middle of the Nevada desert, as opposed to a densely populated suburb next to a major city in the heartland? Is it military implications? Is there some rarefied kind of waste there that is so dangerous and so toxic they have to know exactly what it's doing? Or is it that if they responded with that intensity in North St. Louis at Westlake, 
at Coldwater Creek? Would it throw people into a panic because they would understand how dangerous the situation is? I am more convinced than ever that the Environmental Protection Agency, put that in quotes, exists to manage and diminish the righteous panic and anger of a people who have been swindled out of the futures they envisioned and deserved because of some nuclear assholery. Those so-called experts twist language and pull diminishing adjectives out of some devil's playbook. No immediate danger. That's right. It takes years, if not decades, for the damage caused by radiation exposure to show up, but it will show up. No significant radiation leak? Excuse me, what does the word significant mean, and don't give me any more palliative adjectives? Give us numbers, percentages. Where exactly is the line drawn between what's significant and not? And who gets to decide? And how do they do it? The future is what is at stake. The future of all of us. What the hell are you doing to us and allowing to be done to us? EPA, Gina McCarthy, President Obama, all you so-called nuclear experts, get off your butts and start doing your job. Grow some ovaries and then start protecting life instead of allowing it to be poisoned from the ground up. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, KTVI, CBS Evening News, usace.army.mil, fox2now.com, reviewjournal.com, santafenewmexican.com, capecodtimes.com, timesfreepress.com, richmond.com, plymouth.wickedlocal.com, New York Times, ocregister.com, newsmax.co, Alternet.org, SputnikNews.com, AP, our friend Iori Mochizuki and Fukushima Diary, DailySaba.com, Asahi.com, Mining Awareness, TheGuardian.com, DurhamRegion.com, MichiganRadio.org, FemaleFaust.blogspot.com, The Leftover Indentured Goblins Who Write for World Nuclear News, and the ever-loving, ever-linking activists of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is now on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly the Veterans Truth Network. The show is also available on iTunes under podcast, and the archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. Three people I neglected to thank for their help with last week's Westlake special, episode number 227, Maggie Gunderson and Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.org and Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that just like rats jump off a sinking ship, remember that Bill Gates sold all his stock in Westlake Landfill Operator Republic Services just as soon as the emergency plan went public. See? We've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.